Hello and welcome to the Feisty News for Women. I am T. Erica. I present important women's issues and fearless feminine voices disrupting our society. Today is February 26, 2022. Here is the Feisty News for Women. In world affairs, Russian President Vladimir Putin launched a military attack on Ukraine on Thursday with explosives heard across the country. Its foreign minister warning a full-scale invasion was underway. Putin, who has been serving as president of Russia since 2012 and was also president from 1999 until 2008, ordered Russia's assault on Ukraine after he declared that Russia could not feel safe, develop, and exist because of what he claimed was a constant threat from modern Ukraine. Russian forces attacked Ukraine from three sides by land, sea, and air in an attempt to take over the capital. Ukraine, Ukraine's president confirms Russian forces are advancing on the capital, adding the fate of Ukraine is being decided right now. Today we have Allison Gill, the host of The Daily Beans, a progressive news podcast where you can get your social justice and political news with just the right amount of snark. Welcome to the feisty, Allison. I know you've been doing your foreign affairs research. Can you describe what is happening between Russia and Ukraine right now? Yeah, sure. First of all, T. Erica, I want to thank you for having me on the Feisty. I really appreciate that. Um, I have been discussing the situation going on in Ukraine with experts all week because I am not an international um, a policy expert, but I do know quite a few, including the Vindmans, Colonel Alexander Vindman, who is a Ukrainian American and testified in the first impeachment trial of the former president, and his wife, Rachel, who is a NATSEC hobbyist on social media. And from, from talking to these experts, this has been a very long time coming. Putin has had his eye on, on getting the, the totality of Ukraine back under Russian control for a very long time. And the thing that was stopping him during the former president Trump's administration was that Trump was already doing a very good job at deconstructing and attacking the NATO alliance. So he didn't need to do that. And then with the election of Joe Biden, we now are rebuilding NATO and NATO is strong and we are all on the same side again. And that has pushed Putin to probably what he sees as his final legacy that's going to put him in the history books. And for some reason, he's operating in the 1800s when people just took over countries that were sovereign and independent. And so he's invaded and he's named two of areas of uh, Ukraine as independent nations. And he has gone in and is now attacking to take by force the country. And I think eventually remove President Volodymyr Zelensky of Ukraine and replace him with somebody who will do his bidding like he did in Belarus. Thank you, Allison. You know, I read that there are air raids happening and Russian troops are advancing. How are the citizens of Ukraine reacting to this attack? Uh, the people of Ukraine are very proud and very strong. Uh, the president himself has put on fatigues and a flak jacket to fight with the people. The people have said that they will take up arms. Um, and from what I've seen, there have been air raids in the capital of Kyiv, and many people have been relegated to subway tunnels, like in World War II, underground bomb shelters to, to protect themselves from these incoming air raids. And even the people of Russia are taking to the streets to protest this war. They do not want to see their sons and daughters come back being slain in a, in, in a senseless war that accomplishes nothing. And the US's response along with our NATO allies and partners in the EU and, and elsewhere, I believe there are 30 countries in NATO right now, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, have put together a, a series of stepped up serious sanctions to cripple the ruble and the Russian economy in response to what Putin is doing. And this is the first ground war invasion like this we've seen in Europe 
uh, since World War II. And it's, um, it's scary. And uh, the people of Ukraine are resolute. In fact, there was a tiny island that was taken by the Russians that was had, I think, two men and 11 women. And when the Russian warship came up, the women on the radio said, go F yourself. You're not welcome here. They did lose that stronghold and the Ukrainians perished. But the people are standing up. They're fighting for their country. They're fighting for their sovereignty and they're fighting for democracy, not just in Ukraine, but in Europe and around the world. Allison, is there a chance that Russia's attempts to overtake Ukraine will be successful? Uh, we are hoping that Putin will not be successful. There are early reports out now uh, that they've been pushed back, but he's only sent in 30 percent of his troops. Um, taking Ukraine might not be as difficult for him because the Ukrainians are outmatched in number and weaponry, but holding it will prove to be difficult, if not impossible for Putin. And I think the NATO alliance will push him out eventually. But at what cost? There will be so many lives lost and it's just absolutely tragic what's happening. Um, how that will impact the rest of the world is democracy, I, I believe, will prevail. And that's what the important thing here is. And that's why we have to focus on strengthening our democracy here at home too. Because if democracy in the United States perishes, it could perish globally as well. Thank you so much for joining us and informing us about this tragic world event, Allison. Thank you so much, T. Erica. And I encourage people to follow experts on foreign and Ukraine policy like Alexander Vindman on Twitter to get the latest updates. Follow Allison's podcast, The Daily Beans, on your favorite podcast platform for a more detailed view of this world event and so much more. In other news, a neuropsychiatrist went to the high court in India to speak on behalf of Muslim, Muslim girls who have been banned from wearing their hijabs in schools and colleges. He cited the Quran, which he said stated, Muslim women should wear a hijab and not expose their body parts such as head, neck, etc. And this could not be ignored. The judge argued that a ban on wearing hijab amounted to banning the Quran, but the judges disagreed stating that there is no ban on wearing a hijab in the state, only in the schools. College officials say students in India are allowed to wear the hijab on campus, yet they ask them to take it off inside the classroom, declaring a prohibition of hijab in classrooms as part of the college uniform code. The controversy over hijab first started a month ago when a group of six Muslim students at a government-run women's college in Udupi district was denied entry into their classrooms because the administration alleged they were defying the rules by wearing the hijab. The girls, however, defiantly resisted the pressure even when they were made to sit outside the classrooms on stairs. In fact, all women who attempt to wear a hijab in classrooms are now being made to sit in a separate classroom for their lesson, segregating Muslims who make up only 12% of the state. Wait, what? Men don't wear a hijab, so this is a direct attack against the women's right to freedom, education, and a sense of autonomy over self. After hundreds of years of wearing hijab to honor their religion, now, all of a sudden, it's not allowed? All because a man made a decision and decided that it was right? I am livid and at the same time sad that patriarchy is trying to control women again, just because they can and foolish followers don't think for themselves. They just follow along trying to control women because they have no control over their own lives. This is terrible. In other news, when it comes to birth control, most men believe it's really none of their business, yet it quickly becomes a major concern when a child is born and financial responsibility is established by the court. Mm -hmm. Use a condom, pull out, get a vasectomy, abstain, or let her figure it out. Those are the birth control options for men in today's society. Yet, a new development, a new study, may allow men to take matters into their own hands. A new jail developed by the Population Council and the NIH's Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development is supposed to decrease the man's sperm production without decreasing his sex drive. 
in hope of reducing his chances of fathering a child. The gel contains two hormones, testosterone, which blocks natural testosterone production in the testes and reduces sperm production, and a replacement testosterone, which helps maintain sex drive and other natural functions depending on the hormone. The gel applied to the man's shoulders nightly will be tested for its effectiveness in preventing pregnancy and researchers will track how diligent men are at applying the gel daily. This is a study, it's research. The gel hasn't been approved yet. The study will last for two years, but if approved, do you think men will even try to use the new birth control method? We should use this to our advantage. Let's make a deal. Let's say researchers report that men refuse to use the birth control consistently. If they find that men are careless about birth control, then we acknowledge that birth control is the woman's responsibility. And if so, so is every part of her body. She has full dominion over it and what goes in it and out of it. Deal? Time for a break. But when we come back, should white women be allowed to wear black hairstyles? What is cryptocurrency and how can we use it to boost our finances? Answers to these questions and more right after the break. My name is Shivangani and I am the CEO and founder of Feather and Bone. Feather and Bone is a skincare company for mama and baby. Our products only have three pure, safe and gentle ingredients straight from Mother Earth. Our formulations are inspired by Indian Ayurvedic traditions. My journey started when I was 12 years old after I had a terrible reaction to a store-bought face wash. I really struggled to find something clean and pure for my face. I experienced something similar during my pregnancy and also when I was trying to find clean, pure and safe products for my son. Unable to find something, I created my own line and it did super well. In fact, our face wash is the first ever face wash tablet that has won Best Cleanser a few times. It is my mission to help other mums to make life easy. And so if you're looking for safe, pure, natural ingredient products that are straight from the first mother herself, Mother Earth, then Feather and Bone products are for you. I want to help all of us feel skin confident. Welcome back. I am T. Erica with the feisty news for women. Girl, guess what? These are becoming more tax savvy due to the rise of digital currency. In the past year, cryptocurrency thieves have stolen billions of dollars in virtual assets since the Bitcoin boom. While the thievery does not make the national news like traditional bank robberies would, the tech savvy early investors in cryptocurrency are feeling the sting in their di digital wallets. Let's talk to Cynthia DeWolf, who is the Amsterdam-based marketing lead at Bright Union, a DeFi insurance aggregator. Cynthia aims to reduce hacks in crypto and make decentralized insurance coverage as comprehensive as possible. Welcome to the show, Cynthia. You are a woman in decentralized finance. It's an industry that many are curious about yet afraid of. Can you break down what cryptocurrency and DeFi are? And why are these concepts important to our financial futures? Yes, of course. Uh, hi, by, by the way, everybody. Uh, my name is Cynthia, T. Erica. So happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me to your show. I'm uh, very happy to share uh, some of my knowledge to your community. And yes, uh, let's dive right into it. Um, so I'm Cynthia and I'm, uh, I'm a marketing lead for Bright Union and I'm in the DeFi space. Uh, I think DeFi space is a little bit more advanced, so maybe I should start all in the beginning. Uh, uh, DeFi stands for Decentralized Finance, and um, it, it, it belongs to the crypto space. And uh, there are different reasons why people find crypto so, um, you know, why they're so excited about this. And um, of course, for one thing, it's because there's a lot of uh, opportunities in there, a lot of investment opportunities, but it didn't start like that. It actually started because of the technology and uh, it's because block, uh, crypto was built on blockchain and uh, blockchain is a technology that has some certain characteristics that makes 
um, you know, transactions very secure. So maybe it's good to dig a little bit deeper into those uh, characteristics. Uh, one of that is that uh, blockchain is transparent, meaning that every transaction that happen is open to everybody. And it's also um, uh, distributed and decentralized. And decentralized means that there is not one single um, uh, authority that's, that's regulating the whole uh, thing. So it's, it's meaning that it's a decentralized system. So um, cryptocurrency is an alternative uh, finan financial ship system, and it's uh, built by the people and for the people. So they're using technology to, um, yeah, to decentralize things, and it's it's also immutable. So that means that all information that is stored on the blockchain cannot be changed. So it's um, it's hack proof. Thanks, 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 Cynthia. Can you help us to understand why investing in cryptocurrency is a good idea, even though there have been there have proven to be so much thievery? I think nowadays it is not profitable anymore to just have your money idle. So uh, you should put it to work. And uh, crypto is just one of the different alternatives that are out there. I mean, there's also real estate, there's also just regular stocks. Um, and I think um, obviously crypto has a lot of risks. So it is, it is very important to diversify your investments to, you know, to, to mitigate those risks. I mean, the, the saying goes, don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Uh, but for sure, crypto is one thing that is um, worth looking into. Cynthia, you sell DeFi insurance. How is insurance work in the DeFi industry? Is it different from regular insurance? Normally, the insurance company is earning a lot of money because people are spending every month, you know, money on their insurance, but almost yeah, nothing ever happens or there's not always a claim and meaning that the insurance company is becoming more rich and rich every day. But with a blockchain, blockchain everybody can replace the insurer and everybody can um, earn with this. So you're, you're, you're giving back the rewards to the community. And I think that's what's so beautiful about, the, about this technology. You know, the, the blockchain, like I said, is extremely is secure, but the people, the developers who are building it can make, can make mistakes and therefore you can have weak spots uh, in the technology. So there are hackers every day to find those weak spots. And um, yeah, so that's another thing. You, you should do your uh, own research. And um, because those hacks are up in, uh, happening frequently, um, people also want to mitigate those risks. And that's why uh, the crypto community came up with the, his own solution. And uh, that is decentralized insurance. And that means that, you know, like, like I said, that everybody can replace the insurance and earn for cover covering somebody else. So that means that you pay a, a small amount that is 2.5% of your uh, of your, uh, your your tokens uh, to ensure your amount against uh, hacks, uh, protocol failures or scams. Well, I'm sure you made some mistakes and learned a lot of lessons during your first experiences with DeFi. What was your experience in investing in cryptocurrency like when you first began? Yes, yeah, so um, I think uh, in my very first projects, I was paid in tokens and um, I literally saw it, uh, yeah, excuse my language, I saw it as uh, f it money. So I got paid in tokens and I thought if I will lose it, I lose it. So, so my, what I believe is that you should only invest what you are, what you, you know, are okay to lose. And um, yeah, after that, there was a huge bear market. I think it lasted almost for three years. So that meant that, you know, the, the, the value that it had, it decreased. Okay, so I think I had about 30 different tokens. Um, I think my Bitcoin and my Ethereum were making profit, but I had a lot of, we call it altcoins or maybe even shit coins. And uh, imagine if I would spend uh, 200 or 100 euros on all of them. And at the end, they were all one or two euros. So they lost 99% of their value. Okay, and then after three years, all of a sudden, um, the market went better and uh, tokens start rising. <laughs> I think in, uh, in, in what I did in the process when it was a bear market, I, of course, I made a mistake because I sold all of my shit tokens, but I never sold any of the good ones. So we call this HODL. You know, you hold all your tokens and uh, that's, that's the thing that you should always do if you're a beginner investor, you should not touch them, you should not sell them, uh, despite all of the fear that there is in the market. 
and uh, that's what it, what I did. So we went up a lot. I think I earned uh, three to four hundred percent of my initial um, investment. I think I took some profit out of that. So I took my I took out my initial investment and I left left my profit in there. And um, yeah, at some point, point we got another uh, run, so it, it went even higher. <laughs> but what happened twice after that is, of course, we got a huge crash. So I've seen my portfolio, um, yeah, decreasing with 50% two times, and that happened, I think, a couple of months ago. The last time I even uh, promised myself that I should take profit, but I'm extremely bad at it. I'm I'm, I'm very good at buying when the market is extremely uh, bearish so when everybody is in doubt or when everything is collapsing I'm, I'm, I'm good with buying but when it's extremely high I'm, I'm very bad at selling so um, that means again I lost a lot of a lot of my uh, assets but as long as you don't uh, sell anything you don't lose anything so that is um, that is my uh, uh, that is the way how I invest there are other people who are more you know swing trading but I think that causes a lot of um, uh, in anxieties and uh, bad markets because it does a lot of uh, to your uh, emotions. Uh, some people are leverage trading, some people are yield farming. There, so there's a lot of things that you can do from little risk to more risk. But I'm I'm more of a holder, <laughs> a holder and a staker. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for for giving us so much knowledge about cryptocurrency. Please do come back with progress updates on your personal journey. We want to see you become a millionaire. In other news, is it cultural appropriation for a white woman to wear black hairstyles? What about a white woman going to a black hair salon? A post on Reddit in the Am I an A-hole subreddit posed the latter question and her inquiry went viral. A white woman wrote that she had trouble managing her hair for years until she met her best friend in college who had a similar hair texture to hers. Her best friend was a black woman and shared her hair care products that helped her manage her hair and even took her to a hair salon managed by black hairstylists. And she was hooked when she saw the results. She decided that she will only go to black hairstylists from then on and she was happy with her decision until she casually mentioned to her white friends that she would only attend black hair salons. They accused her of cultural appropriation, shaming her for going to a black hair salon. She was confused and wondered if she was wrong for doing this. Thankfully, the majority of the commenters on Reddit who replied were supportive of her saying, thanks for supporting black businesses and go to the hair salon that does your hair the best. Yes, exactly. Thank you, smart people of Reddit. You came through this time. But this brings up a larger question that many are afraid to tackle. Is cultural appropriation really a thing? Britannica defines cultural appropriation as it takes place when members of a majority group adopt cultural elements of a minority group in an exploitative, disrespectful, or stereotypical way. To exploit something means to make full use of and take and derive benefit from using something. Okay. Well, celebrities who've been accused of cultural appropriation, Iggy Azalea for wearing braids in her hair and dancing to Indian music in traditional garb, Miley Cyrus, who once created hip hop music and included black dancers in her music videos, and Katy Perry, who wore cornrows in a music video and a kimono in another one. I don't know if it's just me, but I find it exciting to watch other races embrace, or most people would say imitate other cultures. In order to imitate them, you have to study, spend time with, and then identify with what you've learned. That's the best way to bring us all together. Maybe we should all be cultural appropriators. Maybe it should be mandatory to spend time appropriating a different culture to end the cultural divisions that provoke racism. I believe the fact that those appropriators can only identify with the beauty of the cultures they imitate rather than the pain of being minorities is what pisses people off. So, you mad because they can sample your beauty and not your pain? Why do you need them to feel your pain? Why do you need to connect with others over shared pain? You want a trauma bond instead of a bond of the best parts of your ethnic lifestyle? Why? Or is it the fact that they are being celebrated and making money from wearing your culture as a costume that they can take off at any time 
a privilege you don't have. I get it. I know I would feel angry if I had a handicap that someone imitated for their benefit and then casually tossed to the side when it was, of, when it was of no use to them anymore. But is your culture a handicap? Mine isn't. I am a black woman. And every time any woman comes to me for advice or help, I feel that my blackness is one of the secret ingredients that they're looking for. And I give it to them without shame. If that secret ingredient is what they need to make money, feel confident and safe or powerful, then I want them to have it too. This isn't a competition. I'm not looking to be mad at anyone for not sharing my pain. I'm hoping to bond with people over success, shared success. If wearing cornrows helps you feel badass, go do it. If you can learn how to twerk and make money from it, go for it. Black women have been straightening their hair and wearing wigs that resemble Caucasian hairstyles for decades, hiding their natural crowns, dyeing their hair blonde so that it will be more acceptable in our society, exploiting or benefiting from that decision. And no one says a word. If a woman makes a decision that makes her feel good about herself, let her do that. When you voice your angry opinion and lash out at her because you want her to identify with your pain too, you're no worse than those men who actively try to control a woman's choice because he is being controlled by patriarchy. You're better than that. Choose to be better than that. Thank you for watching the Feisty News for Women. I am T. Erica. Remember, be feisty. Women must be seen and heard. Welcome to the feisty. Welcome to the feisty. Welcome to the feisty. News for women.